My name is Rory, and it's such an honor to be here in Budapest. Uh, it's my first time working and exhibiting in Hungary, so it was uh, lovely to get the invitation from Flora and to be part of this um, yeah, uh, very um, visceral show about the care and support. Um, we're going to be... I'm going to be speaking for quite a bit, so there'll be quite a lot of listening. So be before this listening takes place, I'm just going to ask you to do something very simple, so don't worry. It's very on the edge of being participatory. <laughs> so don't... Uh, and there's darkness as well, so... Uh, yeah. The first thing that... The, the first thing you just need to do is just feel comfortable in, in your chair. So maybe just like uh, wiggle your bum, <laughs> put your feet solidly on the floor. Maybe you give your like knees a little shake. You can massage your ankles. <laughs> And then maybe if you just become a bit more aware of your hands, and maybe before you become aware of your hands, it can be in the shoulders a little bit. And then from the shoulders into your elbows. And from your elbows into your wrists. and into your wrists, into your hands, and into your fingers. You can send little sparks out into a room. <laughs> and as you gather those sparks, just bring the energy between your hands and start to imagine that you are sculpting some kind of sphere or some kind of ball that's within your hands. Maybe that ball becomes bigger, or it might become tiny. Maybe from a ball it becomes more like string. You just let it transform. Just let it go back into the wrists. And then into the shoulders, and then just let it go. Okay. So now that you've got this energy in your hands, I'm just going to ask you to do one little thing on a piece of paper. So there should be a pen and paper there. And you can look at the paper and kind of imagine that it's a bit like a, maybe it's a map which is yet to be written. Or maybe it's like an ocean if you put, if you look down on it. But if you get your piece of your pen, and I just want you to draw or write something you would like to have with you if you were at sea. If you were floating on something at sea, what would you like to have with you? You take that maybe pleasure is survival. <laughs> okay, I'll give about like a minute.
So if you if you if you want to continue as I'm talking, that's also fine. But so uh, if you've done it, you can just let it rest and sleep under your chair. <laughs> we'll return to it later. So I'm going to be talking for the next forty-five minutes or so, with a few little interludes here and there. Um, but I'm going to be sharing about one specific work called Rafts, which is here in the exhibition, and it's a work where I spent, I think, in the end, two and a half years working on, and it's in many ways a work which is also ongoing. I think when we make work as artists or with any field, knowing when something ends. Is also a quite a big question, and also how we take care of a work once it's made. And I'm going to start off with sharing a series of voices from those I worked with. It's part of an audio guide which was、uh, made by the Serpentine for where this work was first commissioned and shown, and it's about five minutes. So close your eyes. Uh, and just listen, however feels best for you. So here, I'm going to start bringing some more voices into the room. What have you been learning in the last few days? What kind of what kind of moves have you been developing?、Um, the like the moves to just flow through the air, like. I don't know. Make the world yours, if that makes sense. I don't know how to explain it. Like, just like to be free. Save, only save. I feel when free, free to truly be. When rain falls all around. Oh, it's like I know. It's like. My life on dance, and like I throw away my problems when I'm dancing, because you are so concentrated on remembering the moves, you know, enjoying yourself. So I forget about my worries. If you can fall, can fall asleep to all I know, then call out to all I know and roar. Three, two, one, action. I'm cut. Brilliant. What are the essential things which keep us afloat? That take us and enable us to get from one place to another, and that, of course, the raft is a symbol of what is most precarious in what keeps us afloat. But thinking it of it not just as that of a precarious thing, but of an essential thing. So that essential thing might be shelter, having the materials and space to be able to live, but also to dream and to. Think in a way in which allows creativity as a process to、um, do that. When I'm at the drawing board, I can't escape. That is, my mind just goes. I can be anywhere, but that I just shut myself and away. And I also、uh, write for our newspaper that Jacob started, and、uh, we started something called Tina's Tidbits. I got into creating vision boards, and I created this board. It's, it's like a map, but I wasn't aware at the time when creating it. I just had a rough idea, going through certain magazines, what pictures resonated with me, and internally, what transformation I'd like to see occur in my life. I just kind of put down like things I know that I might want to hear. Reading it, flipping through, they say, I, "I'm listening to you," or、um, "I was thinking about you today," and telling you how strong you are, and 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 giving just encouraging words for them. 
that they might need at that time. Not very good imagination, and it just escapes. It's very good, that. That's been a big saviour to me, that drawing board. Without that, I'll be lost. I was in need of rescuing from myself. So this vision board is a kind of a reminder that I can get to that place, that I can rescue myself. I know there's certain things that are beyond our control, but we do have choices and we can create, and we can create our own narrative and our own stories and map out our own futures. If you was to create your own vision board, what would it look like? What images would you pick to tell a story of how you view your life so far and where you see it going? So that, that is an extract called Dreaming, which um, was made as part of a whole series of, I think, eight different sections chronicalizing the work made during this two-year-long commission. And when you work over such a long period of time, there is so much material which is created and so many voices. And in a way, it's it's impossible to include that in the final work. But I wanted to just start with that so you get a sense of just how many voices or uh, th words were spoken during this process. But for me personally, before I even started working with people, I, I draw a lot. My drawings are pretty childish, sometimes a bit like a, a nine-year-old on acid, but I, I, I have to draw. Uh, I, I'm an obsessive sketchbook maker, and for me, drawing is a way of trying to figure out where things are going. And as I started this new body of work, before I even had a title or anything, I made this painting which is actually very small. It's about 10 centimeters by 15, so about this big. And it's, it featured uh, uh, the sea with a raft on it with three people. But uh, very key is almost a broken heart and then an ambulance with a person in some kind of bed. I don't know what quite has happened to that person, but it, it sort of started with this image and I had no idea what was coming the next two years really. No idea of a, of a pandemic, no idea really of a breakup, but this image was there um, and in a way I look at it now, but in some way it fall, it fall it, it was a premonition or a vision of something. And there also is a raft. And this raft um, is maybe as a visual metaphor, is, a, is something which has evolved after other metaphors which have, or anchors which I've been using. I'm an obsessive plastic bag drawer. I draw a lot of plastic bags. Um, but I'm, and I also actually, I'm, uh, I have a friend in the audience who I haven't seen for a long time, and we f first met when I was carrying a harp in a stairwell, so I always carry a lot of things with me. But I, I'm, I'm interested in what other things which we carry with us, but also what carries us, ourselves. And this raft is one which carries. 
And as I started to kind of draw more rafts obsessively, I began just looking and thinking what it is, this symbol. And one particular thing which struck was that um, there's a, a theory within, the, within human evolutionary science, but also specifically within linguistics, that the moment humans started making crossings across the sea, that human language had to be at a point where we had developed an ability of grammar or sharing in a way in which we as humans trusted that when we crossed the sea that we would end up somewhere. And maybe it was because we had heard that there was land which was more abundant or that when we were fleeing from somewhere or some danger that there was land out there and that came from a, a conversation between humans but also just the ability to navigate, to navigate the stars and that language and stories had to be at a, a developed point within our human linguistic journey. More drawings came. I became very obsessed with drawing rain, specifically pink rain. Um, and as I started to think about the symbol of a raft, I was just reflecting on my own stories that I grew up with. And in particular, actually, the story of Noah and the Noah's Ark story and this biblical story of a flood that was coming and that somehow with the change of the weather, there is this premonition of rain. So this is a, a house sort of lost at sea. And then this drawing almost is like a prevision from an earlier film called The Undercurrent. And then sort of zooming out and thinking about the raft, um, I, I, I encountered a piece of writing by uh, a writer called R. R. Buckmer Fuller who wrote a text called um, a Spaceship, uh, uh, Earth as an operate, um, Operating Manual for a Spaceship, where he makes this comparison of the Earth as a lonely life raft floating through space, which is holding us all, and how vulnerable this Earth is, and how that particularly came from the moment in which the first image of the Earth was beamed back to us from the moon, when this desolate moon could be seen in comparison with this blue and abundant earth. So gathering these symbols, these anchors, I began to be kind of ready to work because the Serpentine Gallery had called and uh, <laughs> I had to come up with something. But um, it, as an artist, there's always this dilemma of being able to kind of cultivate your own world. And then when, when, when you are asked of something, how that corresponds. And I had the great privilege of working with uh, Lizzie Graham, who's here, Amal, and Leila, uh, from the Serpentine team as a, on a commission called Radio Ballads, where they were commissioning four artists to create new uh, works which reflected on this series um, made in the ninth, end of the 1950s, in the 60s, which were for BBC. And these radio ballads, as they were called, were really important in the UK as marking a moment of transition 10 years after the war when uh, a huge amount had, of change had taken place. There was a new move, movement of labor, of industrialism, of, uh, of work, of immigration. And there was a specific part of London called Dagenham and Barking, or Bag Barking and Dagenham, which um, was completely built after the Second World War to house 
those where uh, the East had been bombed and um, that there's new homes created. But there was a lot of influx of people coming from Ireland to work and there were a, a large Ford factory, the car industry was very big there. And these radio ballads which were made are a very important part of social history, chronicalizing workers' voices on the radio. And the Serpentine were looking at creating four new ones 50 years later, um, kind of marking the moment of 50 years since the Equal Pay Act between men and women. Um, but also just to look at what uh, work, but specifically care, meant in this 10 years since austerity, since the financial crash. And what do care and support structures look now in this very complex time, which is in the UK, but also, of course, has resonances in different ways uh, in all contexts. And as I started this conversation, um, I was paired or introduced to a, a wonderful organization called Green Shoes. This is not their logo, but <laughs> uh, I, I was Googling and thought, oh, this is a nice green shoe. But they are a, um, a charity offering different forms of creative workshops, drama, writing, music, songwriting, for those with different um, experiences of mental health. So anyone can use their services, but quite often people who have been referred by a doctor or uh, an existing mental health service recommends people to this creative uh, charity where people have the opportunity to, to, to make and think things through through creativity. And I started the process with actually volunteering as part of the charity for three months. Um, helping out just as an extra pair of hands, uh, doing teas and coffees, just for getting to know the group, but also making sure that when I came back with my own project, that they knew who I was. So when a poster was put up, it wasn't, oh, who's, who's Rory? They could put a name to a face. And through my kind of work over the years with social practice, that notion of volunteering or being part of something is, I increasingly do that more and more. I actually uh, uh, joined a line dancing group for a year before I um, was able to work with line dancers. So this is sort of quite often a process that I do. But anyhow, I came back to the, the, the charity um, offering a, the, uh, a series of workshops all under this title of rafts. So to a, for a group to come together and think through different creative exercises of what this symbol of a raft meant to them. What keeps people afloat? What journeys people are on on their lives? And that this could be done in a way which also resonated in what they felt was natural to them. So I didn't kind of conclusify it to creative writing or drawing. It was that we would give the opportunity that that it could be expressed in any way. So we had a wonderful group of eight respond. Uh, Eddie, Karina, Dee, Liam, Butterfly, Mark, and Hugh, and Katie. And we started off, actually, our workshop passing around uh, nail polish, pretending it was like a little ship as we all made a storm, going from a, a roaring waves to... Uh, to quiet wind with also a very stagnant moment. Um, but yeah, and then we thought about what are the rafts in our lives, whether that be family, security, the government, pets. Here someone has written my bed, my job, feeling, the earth. And as we as, as we we were very lucky to do six weeks of workshops um, we also thought about what items we need on our rafts so I don't know if anyone has this on their piece of paper but very important was an aura of courage which you might have seen in the film and as we started this process 
me as a maker as well, it was very important to introduce the idea of recording. There was knowledge that we were going to make a film eventually, but how to get to a point in which people felt safe to record and that their voices uh, were going to be, would be archived in some way. So we talked a lot about why we record. When we record, who is listening or who are we speaking to? And I'm just going to play a 30 second clip of one of those um, voices where we each went to a corner of a room and made a recording, just imagining who might be listening to this, our voice. Whoever hears this and has the power to do so, come back and save our planet Earth from destruction. Make the people realise the importance of this planet. Thank you. So that's just a very short clip, but we finished our six weeks of workshops with those recordings and then the pandemic hit and like most most of probably everyone here we found ourselves in these boxes on zoom and from working very much in person um, we had to quickly figure out how on earth we were going to continue and Zoom wasn't even in our vocabulary, I think, then. But we were, we were quite confronted about these questions. Firstly, who has technology? Does everyone even have a, a laptop or something where we could make workshops? And actually, in our group, not everyone did. But also just, who, for whom is, it, is home actually a safe space to speak from? this charity offered a space in which people could leave their homes and come together and have a moment away from the house. So to then be stuck at home raised also a huge other series of questions. But somehow we persevered. We quickly tried to sort of figure out how a workshop can translate online. Um, but we, we met and we met every two weeks and we continued our dialogue. And from this dialogue, um, I also introduced a whole other group. Um, it was a bit my plan anyway, but previous to this commission, I had just made a film in Boise, Idaho. And um, I had begun working with a, a rehabilitation group at a homeless shelter and um, in that film I made, they, this group only uh, are players are in a in a small role, but I wanted to find a way in which that dialogue could um, could continue because we had only just managed to begin something which felt special. So um, we started workshops with uh, a group in Boise, Idaho, who many actually had never met me because at the at the homeless shelter. The, the people had changed. Um, some were there which had met me, but some hadn't. Um, this is this is the, the entrance to that homeless shelter. But we started our workshops there, separate from a group of London in London, but we asked similar questions and we did similar things. And eventually, this dialogue started to take place, thinking about how we might create support with someone else who might be a stranger or who he'd never met. And especially during that time of the pandemic when people felt so isolated, the notion of just reaching out to someone, it felt special. And I'm going to play you one of those letters first written to between the group of someone in London to Idaho. Hi there, Ida Holmes. My name is Emily. I have just turned 65 years of age, which is surreal, as I feel 28 years young in my head. <laughs> in 
This is a new experience talking to strangers so far away. However, it feels uplifting as a positive way to move forward and connect with you all. In my mind as I write, all of a sudden, you don't seem like strangers, rather friends that I have yet to meet and get to know. Many years ago, I had a thought, what, what it would be like to have a pen friend. Maybe, just maybe, now is my time, if any of you feel moved to reply. For sure, times are sometimes mighty difficult in our lives. So let's pull together with love in our hearts for everyone. It feels wonderful to connect with you so very far away. Let's just imagine you are only up the road, which is less daunting. And through technology, we can and will be able to feel closer together. For now, I would like to share with you what has helped me of late, apart from friends and family. With the magic of the internet, TED Talk, Humour and Health, by Jean Anderson and TED Talk How to Humour Your Stress by Loretta LaRoche and then there's two songs uh, by Hugh Jackman the rehearsal from now on and Kiala Settle the rehearsal This Is Me both these songs are from the film Greatest Showman so folks Whatever is going on for you, frigging COVID-19, personal challenges, etc. Here's little old me, oh hold on, less of the old, as I'm 65 years young only, haha. <laughs> Wishing you all the best, light and love along your way. God bless, Emily, kiss, kiss, kiss. And then Emily got a reply from Jesse. So this, yeah, we were able to continue this letter writing for some time. And then we finally managed to connect the two groups. And for about three or four months, we had a series of constant um, workshops with our group in London, but also far, far away in Boise, Idaho, talking about support, what was getting people through the day, there was a lot of humour, a lot of laughing, telling jokes, asking about the Queen. Um, and yeah, we, we, we built this relationship. And in the final film, actually, it's, it's not so much included. It begins and ends in Idaho. But to be able to film appropriately with people, I, I, I couldn't get to, I literally couldn't get to the US. So it was one of those instances where, in terms of just response, it didn't feel right to responsibly um, film without being there. But this this uh, this process of this exchange is sort of also left for those who were just part of a project. But it is alluded to in, in when we have exhibited it as well. And then all alongside these workshops, I suppose I I come back more to myself. So I I am a musician. I have a background in both classical and pop music. Um, but I my way of figuring things out or creatively doing things apart from drawing is to write a lot of music. And I do write. I've I've I might yeah I have lots of music. Uh, which is it's. I think per rafts I actually had about twenty songs, but it was narrowed down to six or seven. But for me also, when I write music, it's a way of uh, thinking about words and just key images, but also emotionally processing what's going on in my life. But also these workshops through listening to people. And within the songs, there are things which are direct references to maybe what someone has said or has come from a piece of poem. So it is, in the end, a sort of symbiosis process. Uh, one key example of that is just the th phrase don't take fires on board which um, came from Tina in Idaho 
and that is a refrain in one of the songs. Um, finally, a year and three months later, after not seeing each other, we were able to meet from some kind of distance, and it was, yeah, it was it was almost like a, probably you all felt it, but to actually start IRL in real life again, it was almost like we didn't know how, um, but we did, and we were able finally to start filming. And um, and and what happened was everyone took me to a place which was important to them and to speak about what was their raft and how that might be uh, brought together in, a, in an eventual concert which would structure the film. So I'm just going to play the start of the film. And so for those who haven't seen it, uh, here it, this is a bit of a feel of how it starts all the way out in Idaho. song, sung by Declan Rochon, and as the film st uh, introduces with music, gradually those from Green Shoes Arts come to the church and speak, but also they are seen from their, the spaces which are important to them. A lot of people just very um, serendipitously took me to trees which were important to them. And this is a tree um, which is hollowed out, but is somehow still surviving and living. And there is a very beautiful poem performed by Hugh. Drawing and making animation was particularly important for Katie. Just the ability to, um, when you feel stuck at home, to create a world far beyond your walls. Um, 
just that we actually were able to film on a boat as well. This was uh, in a park, very important to Dean. And then, additionally to that, there are kind of two music, or I suppose four music videos. Uh, and we worked with a young people's group to also create choreography, thinking about how they interpret this symbol of the raft. And that was quite a lot through technology. And um, this is them on a racetrack. A key, a, a, a key singer within the, the film is Robin Haddon, who I've worked with for now eight years. And all the way through, there is this undertone of just how important nature is for people. And as a solace or as a raft for people, having access to parks, to green space, but also drawing nature. And a lot of the, the film in the end does take place in a church. And I wanted to honor that within the group, that this notion of faith and belief was a very important uh, role in the lives of those uh, in different ways. There are also many different uh, relationships within that, which are of course complex. But it felt important to bring the, 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 the sort of central anchor that it was a spiritual space. And a running theme in thinking about the raft was just how important dreaming is, but also having a vision. And to conclude, before uh, I invite Lizzie, I'm just going to share the last segment of the film, in which features the voice of Karina, but also Emily, speaking about her feelings towards the future. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self so that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Your will, not thy will, be done. What is my vision? One image I chose for my vision board, which I was particularly drawn to, was of a woman sitting up high on a mountain edge, overlooking a vast landscape. Thing is, at present, I've been struggling to see what my vision is. I thought I knew the vision I had, but as time goes on and things happen, you realize that things change. Visions fade away and you come to the humble realization that at times you just don't know. And that's where God comes in, my God. And I say my God because God is personal, a personal relationship to me. So I ask God every day, what is your vision for me? Because I don't know. Sometimes this can be a casual question, but other times it's a desperate plea, an outcry. What is your vision for me? Another thing, we're all just passing through. We never remain in the same place. We're only just passing through, sharing with each other, sharing how we make it through each day and giving tips on how to build a raft. It's something that you have to build yourself and construct a system of support. And when we create our own narrative, that's when the true magic can happen and miracles are formed.
Hi there. Where am I? Ah, oh, well I'll describe it. Well you know I'm Emily, you call me Butterfly. Near where I live, in the forest area. Pardon? You've got no forest there? Of course I have. What's it called? Well, I'll tell you what it's called. I call it the secret garden. Why? Well, because not many people come in here. When I'm here, in this secret garden, amongst so many different types of trees, different grasses, wild flowers, just helps me. Feels like a raft, just cutting away from what's going on outside in the world. Right now, because of what's happened over the world with COVID and restrictions and lockdowns, I, I do so hope that in the future, when everything goes back to normal. I hope that it transpires that we look after the earth more. Some days we just have to create our own sunshine. These words are like a mantra to me. I regularly remind myself to be mindful and practice gratitude daily. Grateful for all that I am able to do. I suppose I just um, I won't I won't play the re complete end of the film, so it's not spoiling everything. But um, I just want to finish with this one quotation, which is about dreaming. Really, I mean, we might think of it as a very like ambient or out there thing, but to think about it as a political thing, that if we stop the agency of the ability to dream that we find ourselves in a very dangerous or problematic situation and some words that, which are important to me are from the um, the disability advocate and writer Mia Mingus who writes we are building a reality that we have never seen before but we are asking people to flex their visioning and dreaming skills something that is not supported in our society. So what is it to create a support network or system or even like a exercise if we're so keen on our gyms? Why, how do we do that when it comes to dreaming? So thank you for listening for so long. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit with uh, Lizzie who was 
sort of my support throughout the whole two years um, and was key in make, being able to make this whole work. Um, but before we speak, we thought we might just return to our drawings and see what you have on your page. And maybe if you feel confident, we're just going to figure out what, how we might make a connection between what is on our page and someone else. And if you feel shy through speaking, maybe it's literally just looking over, like you're copying homework. But look at, look at what you have, and if you feel confident, just share it to the person nearest to you and see what might be a connecting. And me and Lizzie... We're going to share two together. We're, me and Lizzie are going to do it, and then we'll share. This is, looks like a carrot. No, I like this. But it, I was just trying to think of about pen and paper. But the big question is like, what is a finite resource? Mm. So in all, in all, uh, if I had the complete magical powers, I'd like to see endless. Mm -hmm. I suppose maybe that's what um, I was thinking about in terms of the water. Like, how do we hold something? And also how it's becoming a resource that is contested yeah. in certain parts of the world. Um, and that it's something that enables me to change or transform my mood and my state. Yeah. And that our bodies are already 75% water. So where do you think they might be going from? I think maybe about the idea of resource and scarcity. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're, we're going in the mm -hmm. And then so what? How, how to recall it. And how to distribute. Mm -hmm. Which is why I need the bucket, and which is maybe why you need. Because this is also about sharing with others, isn't it? Yeah. Even if it's just like a sharing process with yourself. Okay, should we return? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, what me and Lizzie have? Um, I drew a bucket. I don't know if you can see. Um, I was thinking about how how to hold. I wrote, how do we hold? And then I was thinking about how water is something that's becoming contested in certain parts of the world and thinking about how we need containers and structures in order to distribute resources and also waters. I mean, I was in one of the baths today here, so obviously water was on my mind, but also it's a, it's a thing that enables me to kind of shift or change my mood, like having a shower or drinking water to um, refresh myself, um, yeah. Yeah, and I drew like a very strange pen with sort of like a, pa pa a stack of paper that, uh, from, yeah, from this, this having a, an item where you're able to externalize so it doesn't just become an inner monologue, but you are able to externalize. And But the big question I come up against is how, how endless is that, that piece of paper mm. or also the pen? So can I, can I have an infinite... Magic pen. Pen, and I don't know if I can. Yeah. So it's also a bit like Lizzie. This, uh, it's, it relates to a resource which is maybe scarce or finite. Mm. So on our journey, we kind of maybe we're both looking for resources. Yeah, I think also the connection is wanting to also share. I think whether that's sharing with yourself or sharing with others. Um. Which is like a very important part, I think, of Ross. Um, that the group, I think the group would be really, well, they are really excited to know that the work is here and that it's landing in Budapest and also resonating with other people. Um, because they're very much a kind of supportive group of each other. So they're really keen that 
their voices traveled essentially and um yeah it's really thanks so much for it it's really nice to see the work so tenderly held as well with the other works and in creating these new relationships and constellations with other artists and other communities and their friends and their families um yeah i just wanted to sort of name that um yeah does anybody have do they want to share what was on their piece of paper or, or, shy? or any questions in general yeah. <laughs> any thoughts or Or do you have one? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, do you mean to answer and then? Mm-hmm. Um, yes, yeah, so maybe I'll say a little bit about my role. So I work in a team of three. So there's me, Amal Kalaf, and Leila Gatton. And we are primarily um, the team that works outside the gallery across London in like lots of different contexts. And maybe it's from kind of like really grassroots organizing contexts to more. Um, civic systems like the social care system or in hospitals or we work with people affected by the criminal justice system whether that's through prison or detention or both Um, and the program has been working now for about yeah I think nearly maybe even 13 years and it began um, on the Edgware Road which is a, a neighboring area to Serpentine, and so like quite local. And it started as the Edgware Road Project, which was led by Amal Kalaf, my um, collaborator and mentor and friend, um, and with another curator called Jana Graham. And so we sort of work in the legacy of that project that was always situated outside the gallery and really about what are the kind of concerns and needs and desires of the neighborhood and how can an artist practice be kind of reorientated to kind of be in service of those areas. Um, So it's quite unique. And obviously, we were working in Barking and Dagenham for this project. So we became more um, geographically sited, whereas the last few years, we kind of work across London and are more issue based. Um, And so we were really lucky to work, I said, like with four artists. And actually, although Rory worked for two and a half years and is ongoing still, um, we were in the neighborhood for maybe about a year, at least, before we brought any artists into the neighborhood. Um, just kind of doing a lot of listening, essentially, and meeting people and building relationships. Because really, um, we are always like guided by um, kind of understanding. Essentially, like, we did a lot of work. Um, yeah, really, it is just meeting people and listening. And um, essentially, the four artists were then brought in in different ways. And so we kind of saw these like resonances between maybe some of the artists' practice, like Rory, and thought, oh, we really feel like this question around the raft and support and recovery and mental health would, would kind of really match with um, Green Shoes. And then the, one of the other artists, Sonia Boyce, um, she was... Uh, basically I've been like meeting a lot of women in women's centers and we were having lots of conversations around relationship dynamics that actually led to a conversation around domestic abuse and actually that area in Barking and Dagenham has like the highest reported rates of domestic abuse in the country. Um, Reported means what is known to the authorities so actually the reality is a lot bleaker than what we actually know officially Um, and so we started collaborating with the Domestic Abuse Commission there. And then there was Alona Sagar, who looked at the industrial history of the area and actually was really asking the question, like, whose bodies are valued, especially in certain labor conditions, and um, looking at essentially um, people who have been affected by asbestos exposure. And like Rory said, it's a, an area that has a really specific industrial history of Ford and all these like factories. Um, and 
Yeah, so she worked with a campaign group and care support group called LASAG, who works with people who essentially are um, terminally ill due to these um, unsafe working environments, which now, if you kind of look at the history, it's like transferred onto a lot of migrant labor um, and is also a kind of international struggle because it was mined a lot in um, South Africa and then brought to the UK. So there's kind of big in, uh, cases that legal cases still ongoing now. Um, and then the final artist, Helen Kamak, who she worked with uh, an organization called Pause, who were working with um, women who've had repeat removals of their children by so the social care system. Um, so we were sort of navigating all of these like different sites of care and how like kind of care um, is given and care is received and also like really complicating that binary. I think you were also very keen on you know, how these things are given and received. And um, the artists, there was always this desire that the artists would be more in conversation with each other. But because of the pandemic, that became increasingly difficult, but also increasingly difficult, like I said, because we were navigating all of these systems, which are, there's a lot of tensions in those systems in the social, I don't know much about the Hungarian social care system, and I'd love to know more if anyone wants to talk about it afterwards, but um, it's an extremely neoliberal um, system in the UK, and really we were trying to look at how does artistic practice um, play a role in thinking about how do we move away from a kind of more administrative inhumane system and looking at a more of a relational system um, through being yeah people-centered uh, so the, some of the artists already knew each other in other lives but actually the works kind of created their own world and their own research trajectory um, which is really important for us actually as a team we're really um, focused on like who is usually excluded from research processes and why are they excluded? And especially when the, a research process or a process of making and creating and visioning um, would be really transformative for those. So I don't know if that answers your question, Flora. Sorry, I thought I just went on for it. But what, do you, did you have anything else to add? Yeah, I think we were so we was because if you're involved with with working with people, if there's all you're already, I think we had a, I was had my group of eight, but then. Alongside that, it was sort of working with young people. So then we're already navigating maybe 25 relationships. Yeah. And then uh, to then have dialogue between ourselves, it just wasn't that possible. But we, I knew Helen mm. before uh, before going. So, But it was lovely to finally come together when the whole exhibition and when yeah. to see our own kind of work. Like it is very like a constellation of planets mm. together um, and yeah and coming to the exhibition here I see sort of rafts in a whole new mm. constellation so it's the sort of magic of uh, when you create something it does become its own planet coming mm. into sort of an eclipse with another yeah. um, uh, thing. Yeah and I think also that although the collaborators knew that we were working under this idea of the radio ballad when they came to the exhibition, everyone was like, "Oh, how how was that going on at the same time as what we were, what we were doing?" And um, I think though that there is um, I don't know similar values and similar commitments in a lot of the works. Um, and you know, I think I was going to read like for our our team, like we have guiding questions, which are like, "What are the ways that social practice?" can become a space to intentionally practice the futures that we long for? And how can collaboration create alternative spaces for contesting power and advocate for new forms of relation? And how can collective imagining be used to assemble individuals for the purposes of dreaming, healing, and resistance? And those questions are, I think, kind of resonate throughout the projects in various different ways. Um, yeah. Great. Well, I know that there's another performance happening tonight, yeah. so I don't want to keep. Do we have any final questions, thoughts, reflections? Well, so we can hang out afterwards if anyone <laughs> yeah, really. is too shy to talk to us up here. Yeah, thanks so much again for, for the invitation, and you did 
and Benny yeah, for Benny. hosting us. Yeah. And uh, it's lovely to be here in Budapest. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>